All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm sure that we will have some more people joining us shortly, but uh, we can get started. I just wanted to welcome everyone to UMDC's annual meeting. This is our first ever virtual annual meeting. I'm Nicole Taylor, I'm the president of the Alumni Club here, and we're really excited to have Michigan Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist joining us tonight as our keynote speaker. Uh, before we hear from the Lieutenant Governor, we just have some brief official club business to go over. First of all, I'd just like to take a minute to thank all of our current board members, committee co-chairs, and committee volunteers that have made this past year so successful for our club. Uh, the past year was not what anyone was expecting, but uh, despite several event cancellations due to COVID, we were still able to put on almost 60 events for our local alumni. Our last in-person event was actually our largest event of the year, our fun, big fundraising event for Congressional Breakfast in March. And since then, our volunteers and board members have really adapted to put on many great virtual events. Can everyone hear me okay? Looks like we might have some issues. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Um, so we've hosted a lot of different virtual events. I'm sure you guys have been able to attend some from book club and podcast clubs to a virtual 5K, 10K. We had a virtual Euchre nights, virtual trivia nights. We've done talkbacks and a lot of different speaker series. Um, so they've really allowed us to get kind of some amazing enriching speakers that we wouldn't normally have access to it for our DC events like our speaker tonight. It's also allowed us to invite alums from all over the country to participate in our events as well. And while we're not planning any in-person events right now this year due to public health guidelines, we have a great slate of virtual events coming up that we'll talk about later. Uh, in order to plan these events, our bylaws require us to have an annual meeting of the general membership to elect our board of governors and committee chairs for the next fiscal year. So with that, I would like to introduce the proposed slate of nominees for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. This slate was carefully chosen um, by our nominating committee after we interviewed several candidates and we had it approved by the current 2019-2020 Board of Governors prior to the annual meeting. As you can see on the first slide, hopefully you all can see that, uh, the nominees for executive board and the board of governors, which includes a past president, a law school rep, and a business school representative. And the governors are generally elected to serve three-year terms. And then the second slide lists our committee chairs and co-chairs for the club. So we have a lot of new volunteers this year joining the board, and we're really excited to see what we will be able to accomplish. Um, can you all still see the slide? Yes, okay. And then we are going to use the chat box feature. Sorry for any technical difficulties. I will need a motion to approve of the slate. So if someone could type a motion into the chat box. Thank you guys. And then I will need a second. Perfect. Thank you all. And then we will need to vote. So you should see a poll come up on your screen for you to approve or disapprove of the slate. And then you can select an option and submit. I'll give you guys a minute. All right. And thank you guys all for voting. With that, I mean, we have a quorum of 35 people in this meeting, so the uh, board slate has been approved. And then I just have a couple of other pieces of official business that we would like to address. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our club is run entirely by volunteers. Each year we like to acknowledge the club's volunteer of the year. 
And the Volunteer of the Year Award is in its third year now, and it's given to a board member, committee chair, or volunteer that's really shown great leadership to the club. This year, our award goes out to one of our Board of Governors members, and he's a programming committee chair or programming committee member as well, and that is David Koss. So David, I'm sure some of you may know his name from a lot of events that he plans. He's responsible for planning all of our really highly successful theater events that we have. He helped our club get tickets to Hamilton, um, which we sold out in like minutes for. Sadly, it was canceled due to COVID, but it was really exciting to have those tickets. And then he really stepped up when we were having to for like close all of our in-person events and do virtual events. Um, he began planning a lot of our virtual events that we've had so far. He helped us get speakers. He helped us get the Lieutenant Governor as a speaker tonight. So he's really been instrumental in securing all of our speakers and our club being so successful. So I'd just like to thank David for his continued service and contribution to the club. Congratulations, David. And then our club's goal is not only to put on great events for our alums, but also to fundraise for our scholarships. Now, fortunately, despite switching to almost entirely free virtual events, we were still able to reach our fundraising goal of $60,000 for the 2019-2020 year, thanks to your generous support. Our club gives out 50,000 in scholarships to help local DC area students attend the University of Michigan through our Carl M. Smith Jr. Lead scholarship in our Samuel L. Chappelle Family Scholarship each year. It also gives out funding to the Michigan and Washington program and the Public Service Internship program every year. Our lead scholarship is awarded every four years, and then the Samuel L. Chappelle Scholarship is awarded annually. So this year we had a lot of applicants for our scholarship, and I'm excited to recognize this year's winner, Merwa Huala, for our Samuel L. Chappelle Family Scholarship. And Merwa is from Falls Church, Virginia. She's a graduate of George C. Marshall High School. She's planning to attend the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts and wants to study economics. And she spent much of her childhood in Lebanon. She's le she learned English as a second language. She tutored other students in her high school's English as a second language program. So we're really fortunate that she was able to join us tonight. So I'd like to thank her for, for coming and introduce her all to you. There you oh, <laughs> my bad. Can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you. Awesome. I, oh my god, okay. <laughs> That's unfortunate. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, my name is Marwa and as Afra mentioned, I am so honored to be joined here today as a recipient of the 2020 UNVC Scholarship. Um, as well as Afra mentioned, I hail from Lebanon, though I was slightly born and raised in Vienna, Virginia, and I graduated from George C. Marshall High School in Falls Church. I'm ever, ever so thankful of the generosity and opportunity the UMDC alumni chapter provided me. Michigan has always reserved a place for itself as my dream school because its breadth of knowledge, intellectual pursuits, and culture is unmatched and unrivaled to any other institution. In fact, the only reason I am able to enroll at UMich is because of the scholarship being provided to me. This coming fall, as April mentioned, I will be a part of the LSA Honors Program, majoring in, in economics and perhaps if spacing does permit, computer science as well. As a first generation college student, the scholarship goes beyond monetary value and carries with it symbolic meaning that will persist with me in both college and beyond. I look forward to becoming a fellow Wolverine this coming fall, though it may be vicariously online. And I'm so thankful for the scholarship and this club to provide this opportunity to me. Thank you so, so much and go blue. Thank you, Marwa. We're really excited, I think, to see everything that you accomplish at Michigan and beyond. So that, me. Yes, that concludes any official business we have. So I'd really like to introduce our keynote speaker now, Michigan Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. The Lieutenant Governor studied computer engineering and computer science at the University of Michigan. He's a former DC resident uh, where he served as the director of new media at the Center for Community Change in Washington, DC. And he spent over three years as national campaign director at moveon.org. 
He's dedicated his career to fixing problems for hardworking families and currently leads the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities. Please join me in welcoming the Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Nicole, and good evening, everybody. It's really uh, a privilege to be here with y'all. Um, I want to congratulate uh, the young, I'm sorry, I want to congratulate, my bad. I want to congratulate the young woman who just won the scholarship and i um, super excited for you and, and what your, uh, just like U of M experiences is, is going to be. Uh, this is going to be a hell of a fall. Um, you know, in terms of what this is going to look like at U of M and frankly at every other university campus. And so just God bless you and Godspeed and, and, and good luck. Uh, everyone on this call, I'm sure, has some, some great stories and uh, great memories and, and have left a great legacy. So, Mara, you really are uh, exactly what this is all about and what we're all here for. Um, as you mentioned, I was a DC resident for five years. Um, and, and so I was part of this club for five years. And I don't know what the Michigan bar is now, but I remember going to uh, uh, Buffalo Billiards to watch football games um, and, and stuff. And so it's, it's just um, good to talk with y'all um, tonight. Uh, it is, um, I think that, I guess the first thing I wanna say is as Michigan alum, uh, we should be really, really proud of the role that the University of Michigan is playing in the state of Michigan's response to COVID-19. We are blessed to have, you know, one of the best uh, schools of public health in the world, one of the best medical schools in the world, one of the best engineering schools in the world, School of Information is world class, and all of those schools have been really critical the epidemiologists that are doing the modeling that we as state and state government are using to make choices are University of Michigan epidemiologists. Michigan became the first state to release um, sort of a, 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 a kind of a map, if you will, of the state of Michigan broken out into regions that breaks down all of our you know, testing statistics, public health infrastructure statistics, um, sort of the state of the phase of re-engaging our economy. Uh, and that's something that was developed in collaboration with the School of Public Health and the School of Information. The College of Engineering, um, my alma mater specifically, has been incredibly involved in helping the state of Michigan build out its contact tracing infrastructure. And obviously Michigan Medicine has been helping both on the research and the delivery of care to people who have contracted coronavirus and have needed treatment um, for COVID-19. We are all over the place when it comes to um, this response. And it's one of the reasons why uh, we say leaders invest because we are stepping up in this moment uh, so much so and, and like I, I represent really hard every chance I get so we are in the midst of a campaign that we're called a mask up Michigan and so I have my U of M mask that I wore here today on the floor of the Michigan Senate when I was presiding um, that I wore when we did a press conference last week I wore a different one uh, that was showing just why it's important for everyone in Michigan to step up and do their individual part and making sure that we can slow the spread of this virus. Um, so I just want you to know that all of you, if you're an LSNA grad or, or any other kind of, um, any, any other school or college run from our campus, know the University of Michigan is part of why the state of Michigan's response to COVID-19, even though we are one of the hardest hit states in the country, um, we have been seen as a leader in terms of how we've responded and how we have uh, done our best to look out for our people. So just um, be proud of that. Uh, I know there are people in this club who uh, have the distinction of having uh, a pretty diverse array of careers and career paths. And, um, you know, mine is certainly my path here to becoming uh, Lieutenant Governor of Michigan elected in 2018 was not a straight one. Um, I told you I went to college engineering, I was a software developer. I did community organizing and political work in DC. I worked in municipal government in Detroit. Um, I actually ran for office in 2017 to be an election administrator for Rare for Detroit City Clerk and uh, lost that race by 1,482 votes. Um, but I think that uh, what I'd like to share is that we really need, and when I say we, I mean like the collective we, as in like the nation and the world, um, really needs um, people like U of M grads um, to be bold in terms of uh, asserting opportunities to be able to contribute and demonstrate leadership. Um, if anything that I've learned in my, my career thus far, it's that 
uh, we can't afford to have talented people sit on the sidelines. We cannot afford to have people who have insights and perspectives to not offer them. We need everybody to have both their hands on the deck, all hands on the deck, all ideas on the table, um, if we're actually gonna get through the challenges that we face. Whether it's this once in 100 year pandemic, whether it is the, these are the, the economic challenges that we face seemingly every couple of years. I mean, in the state of Michigan, I don't know if any of y'all are from mid Michigan, but we had a once in 500 year flood happen in, uh, in late April in Michigan. And there are too many opportunities um, to contribute for anybody to sit them out. And one of the things that I am consistently um, concerned with is I know there are more talented people than the people who are stepping up. And so what I would encourage all of you to do is to think about, in addition to whatever you're doing in your family life, in addition to whatever you're doing in your direct professional life, whatever gets you your paycheck and your health insurance, I would really encourage you to, to find ways to stretch your talent and apply it in a different space. Because something that I've learned in my career is although I was educated as an engineer, um, trained as a, you know, a structured thinker and a problem solver, um, there ain't a lot of engineers in politics. <laughs> and I think that's a bad thing because we need to have people who are working in the policymaking realm who have different experiences and different approaches to dealing with what confronts them. And so I hope that all of you, whether you're an attorney, an accountant, a writer, organizer, a chemist, a dancer, whatever you are, um, you have talent that is likely transferable to another realm. And that you may not be trying or, or thinking about how that talent is transferable, but I really wanna encourage, if not challenge you to do that. Because if you do, you'll, you will often find that the sum of your life experiences have probably prepared you for things that you didn't anticipate. That is literally the story of how my political career began. When I came home to Michigan in 2014, I didn't come home to get into politics. I, I came home because I wanted, I have twin babies who were born in Sibley Hospital in DC uh, on my birthday in 2013. And uh, my wife, who's from Southfield, she, we wanted to raise our children as Michiganders. So we came home when the kids were 10 months old um, and moved into in Detroit. I live in Corktown in Detroit, for those of you who may know where that is, right adjacent to downtown on the west side. And I was raising my kids in Detroit, but I didn't come home to get into politics. I actually came home to like detox from politics. I was working in hardcore, partisan, progressive politics from moveon.org. Um, and I wanted to get a real change of pace. I came home and worked as a technocrat in city government and I completely checked out. I stopped watching cable news. Um, I only watched local news, so I would actually know a little bit about what was happening. Um, I, I, I unsubscribed from all the political email lists I was on. I didn't go to any like local Democratic Party meetings or any of that kind of stuff in Michigan. I completely checked out. And then after the 2016 election, where Michigan was, a real, was really close, um, and I felt like Michigan was close enough, like I'm a Democrat, for those who didn't know. And I thought Michigan was close enough that it could have been won had more voters turned out in the city of Detroit and that uh, President Trump may, would not have won Michigan. And I felt like I needed to do something. So I, I did the millennial thing and I like declared that uh, on Facebook that, you know, I'm gonna, um, people have asked me about running for office before and I'm gonna commit to running for office at some point later in my life. Meaning I was thinking of doing that like in my fifties. Um, but sure enough, like three weeks later, some people in the city contacted me and said, you know what, we think that you should run for Detroit city clerk. I've been working for city government for two and a half years. I had some experience of successes in terms of fixing broken systems in city government, developing some new systems. Like I developed this app that's essentially the 311 service for the city of Detroit called Improve Detroit. I helped to change the way the city manages and maintain fire hydrants. I did the city's open data policy and portal. So I did a bunch of things. And they thought that that would apply well to fixing the voting process in Detroit. Also coupled with the fact that I had worked on voting rights campaigns around the country when I was working at Move On and Community Change. And just to give you some perspective, uh, Center for Community Change's headquarters is, at, is right there at the corner of 16th and U Street, Northwest. So when um, I, I contemplated this with my wife and, cause I didn't even know like what the job of the Detroit city clerk really was, et cetera, but people thought I was really built for it. So we took a couple of months, December and January of 20, December 2016, January 2017, to think about 
Um, could I, was this actually a crazy notion? Should I do this? And when I started to think about it, when we started to talk about the different experiences that I'd had, we actually were able to tell a story that connected those experiences to the task before me. The experience of being a systems builder and an engineer, someone knows how to, who knows how to create things and fix things and make them work for people. The experience of working as a community organizer and a political power builder, the idea that you can help people realize their political attempt political potential and connect them to the exercise the opportunity to exercise their political power um, working in city government understanding how city systems have worked understanding how city systems and their flaws can be understood so that they can be um, altered reformed replaced renewed um, in a way that will be more responsive to people's needs learning how to build trust have people build trust in government because when i came to work for city government in detroit the city government had lost trust over a generation of frankly being lied to by political leaders. When all of these things started to come together from those experiences, it actually made me feel like I was like built in a lab to do the job of Detroit city clerk. So because we were able to construct this, this uh, tell this story and construct this narrative, that was because I wasn't thinking about a political career when I was doing all those things. I was thinking about being the best that I could be in all those areas. And then that ended up adding up to something that made sense in a new arena. Now, while I ran for this office, I wasn't connected politically and I was a long shot. And um, suffice it to say, uh, it was a surprise and I made it through the primary and a nine person primary against a three term incumbent who also happened to be the person who counted their votes, the votes in the election. I lost by less than 2000 votes. What it taught me is that we all, if we are committed to showing up and being present in whatever our experiences are, if we're committed to that, um, we will always get something valuable from it, even if it's something that we fail at. And by and when I lost that political campaign, although I cried like a baby the morning after I lost, um, but I was able to gain some new relationships, new insights, new perspectives, um, a new, a new reputation in the city and in the state. And that is what led to ultimately me um, actually meeting Gretchen Whitmer, our governor, when we were both running for office, me for city clerk, her for governor in 2017. And that led to the, a couple of conversations before she asked me to be her running mate in 2018. And I, and I didn't know when I was running for city clerk that I was actually um, being prepared for the experience of running for statewide office in Michigan. What is the moral of that story? The moral of the story is that if you soak up all of your experiences, you can then point them in a productive direction if that is what you challenge yourself to do. And I don't know what you all are going to or, or are primed or poised or will be pushed to do in your lives. But I know that all of you, because, of the, because I know that we have this common denominator in being Michigan alum, that means I know that we know how to think, we know, I know that we know how to communicate. And those are sort of the two basic steps to being able to do anything effectively. And then no matter what your expertise is, you have a set of experiences and a set of sensibilities that will make your expertise and make the way that you approach and see the world applicable in a number of situations. And the world needs you to stretch out and do more because our challenges are so deep, they're so complex, they're so big that we need more people, we need more hands, more eyes, more elbows, more feet, more boots, more everything to solve them in, a way, in the way that they need to be solved, to have solutions that are robust enough, that are scalable enough, that are responsible enough to, be, to really have an impact and make a difference. I think that's our role as Michigan alum is to find ways to do it. I think that's what we were blessed with the challenge to do because we've had that shared experience. So, you know, so U of M DC club, um, I'm an alumni of this alumni chapter and um, I want you to go and, and have an even bigger impact than you already may be having because I believe that you can. Um, I don't believe that you've reached the peak of that potential for impact and for changing your communities and for changing the world. And so from a person who did not see the, the seat that I sit in right now um, to be a historic elected official is not something that I saw three years ago. I didn't expect that. But regardless of what you are planning for, your plan may not work, but you are absolutely being prepared for something. And there's a difference between planning and preparation. Preparation comes from being present and soaking up everything you can from experience. Planning is your idea about the future, which could be wrong, but your preparation will always point you in the right direction. So um, thanks everybody for allowing me to come and to be part of the conversation. Um, 
you know, I've been to this, I've been a bunch of times when it was the breakfast and it um, was always a fulfilling and enriching experience and I'm proud to participate with everybody tonight. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Governor Gilchrist, um, for joining us. Um, we, have, we have some questions for you, if you have a few minutes. I do, but uh, my, my video got turned off. Okay. I can probably turn it back on. All right. Yeah, I'm go. ready. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, we are very happy you joined us for Congressional Breakfast in the past, and we hope that you join us in the future when we're allowed to have, you know, in-person events of that size again. <laughs> right, um, right. I think the first question is one that a lot of people put in the chat box, which is, where did you get your Michigan mask? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have like three Michigan masks. Um, this one actually, my, my in-laws got me, but I know that um, MDEN is selling, a, sells a bunch. You can buy them online, a bunch of different ones. You can also uh, get some from uh, the university directly at MGO Blue. I got like one that just says Michigan on it. Um, that's pretty dope. So uh, they, they're also, I've seen, my, my wife found some on Etsy. Somebody was making U of M masks. So um, it's a pretty popular brand uh, uh, still. And so y'all know, y'all may not know, but uh, Governor Whitmer went to Michigan State. And so I, I troll her with, with Michigan stuff all the time. And we did a press conference last week that had um, the governor, myself, uh, our women's basketball coach, Coach Rico, um, the women's basketball coach at Michigan State and Tom Izzo. And so I really felt like I had to represent hard at this press conference. So I had like two Michigan masks on at the same time. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm sure that a lot of our attendees will be rushing out to buy Michigan masks. Um, and um, just want to remind everyone to make sure to check out the UMDC merch store in a few weeks when we open because there may be a mask in there as well. Um, how did your time in Michigan inspire you to pursue a career in so my time in Michigan is a good example when, when I talked about uh, preparation versus planning, because like I said, I didn't plan on having a career in this realm. But when I was on campus, I was, so I, I graduated in 05. I was, I was a freshman in 2000 and graduated in 05. So like I was on campus during 9-11. I was on campus and, and helped to lead the student response to our uh, admission policy that uh, used affirmative action being challenged all the way up to the Supreme Court in 2004. Um, I was uh, the head of an organization for black men on campus called Heads um, that met every week in the South Quad Ambatana Lounge every Monday night. Um, so I was a pretty active student, I guess, especially relatively speaking for an engineering student, um, was pretty active in terms of um, just wanting to always be, just sort of understand like what people were talking about and what was happening. And while I wasn't necessarily trying to be like a political leader on campus, like I wasn't part of like the the Michigan Democrats and stuff. I wasn't part of that, but I was pretty active in terms of what was happening socially, particularly in the black community on campus. And I was really, um, I was really, um, I, I was really moved by what happened with the affirmative action stuff. And there was some brutal stuff happening on campus then, like they got pretty nasty. Like, like I remember um, uh, the Young Americans for Freedom chapter did like a affirmative action bake sale where they like were selling baked goods and it was like, um, you know, a white kid could get a get a muffin for ten dollars, and a black kid could get a muffin for a quarter, and all this stuff. And so, uh, y'all can't see this on Zoom, but like, I'm not a small person. Like, I'm six eight and got pretty wide shoulders. And so, we did some like a little bit of physical intimidation to get that shut down <laughs> as far as political action. But um, the reason I'm bringing that up is because I did have some very political experiences when I was on campus, and and sort of had some experiences sort of confronting ideas that I disagreed with and confronting them in different kinds of ways. Sometimes confronting them through dialogue, sometimes confronting them through physical action and demonstration. And that was important to me, um, especially when I, when I went and left my career in technology to become a community organizer and then learning how to like do that for real, but seeing that I kind of went through some of the motions at least in college, that was a really helpful experience for me. And the last thing I'll say is, um, so while I was a double major, I was, uh, due to poor planning, I was two classes, two classes short of an American history minor. Um, and why I bring that up is because I actually ended up uh, firing two advisors when I was in school because the College of Engineering advisors that I had like really 
uh, really besmirched me for taking writing classes. Um, but that was so important to me in terms of um, one, trying to have a more complete educational experience, but two, as a communicator and a thinker, that was critical to be able to articulate my ideas. And so right after college, I started a blog and, that, and the blog I started in 2005 is the connective tissue that led for me to change my career and ultimately change my life. And that probably wouldn't have happened if I wouldn't have exercised and, and sort of learned to be a better writer and a clearer thinker while I was in college. And I, and I still, you know, harken on that today. Related to that, um, what were some of the recent considerations and social calls to action after the murder of George Floyd has resonated the most with you? So, you know, this is certainly the largest scale um, racial justice uh, set of demonstrations that we've seen um, in our generation. And that it's been sustained in so many cities, I think is critically important. Um, you know, the fact that uh, people have um, found ways to do it safely from a COVID-19 perspective. I think one of the things that's really remarkable is that there has not been a city or a county in the country that has been able to point to the demonstrations for racial justice as the source of an outbreak in coronavirus infections. Um, I think that's notable. Um, you know, I, I participated in a couple of uh, demonstrations in the city of Detroit. Uh, the governor and I also did one together, um, right in, on Woodward Avenue um, in Detroit. So I've been struck by the scale and the, the conscientiousness that's been put to, um, that, that has led to that being happening as, as safely as it can in the midst of global pandemic. Um, I've also been struck by how, I mean, there's a couple of things. Like, so I think the people who are demonstrating and calling for change when it comes to law enforcement practices um, have done so, generally speaking, with an amount of respect for what they're trying to do, that they have therefore had the wherewithal to, for the most part, be nonviolent. And the fact that that has been met with violence in a lot of places, um, has made it effective because it's proven the point. And I think that's really significant. I don't think our generation has seen activism that has like proven the point like that um, in a while. Like many of us were probably too young um, to have come of age enough to be, to have been, to at least understood what we were looking at. For example, when you had like the WTO protests in Seattle in like 99, like I remember like that happening on television, but as a 17 year old, like I didn't understand it. Um, but like, looking back on that now like that was a very different enterprise than what we're seeing today so i've been i've been impressed with that i've been impressed that it's been multimedia the, the digital component meeting the component in the street um i've been impressed with that as an organizer and that excites me um what i'm hopeful for is that um there is actually movement by policymakers to take this seriously and to really think about how we create public safety and certainly um the governor and i have announced and enacted a number of reforms here in michigan um, to build on the progress that law enforcement has made, but there's a lot of work to do. And it's also afforded me the opportunity just to like tell my stories, just like as a black man, like, like I lived in Detroit until I was eight and a half and moved to uh, Farmington, which is a, a, in the Northwest suburbs where I went to high school. And I've been able to tell the story in public about how like getting confronted by the police as a nine year old playing tag with a bunch of kids in my neighborhood um, or being pulled over for doing 24 and a 25 when I was 16 uh, two blocks from my high school on the way to school. And it's been something that's been kind of shocking to people. And I, but I tell those stories because like, this is not something you can achieve your way out of. It's not something you can educate your way out of that kind of prejudice. We have to work through that as a collective community. And that conversation is truly important. And I hope that is what sticks. Thank you. Um, the state of Michigan has been one of the few states that has successfully battled COVID-19. Um, what do you think Michigan did well with regards to coronavirus and what could Michigan have done better? I mean, I think that, I think that um, we have seen some independent, independent analysis that show that we have done, um, had it pre been pretty effective in, in containing the, the coronavirus. I think that um, we still need to be very vigilant. Uh, we have been seeing upticks in cases in different parts of the state in Michigan. It has been nowhere near the scale that we've been seeing in the South and the Southeast and what could, I guess the South in the period, whether it's Florida, Texas, Arizona, and a lot of places in between. We haven't seen the scale of that, but we have seen um, cases uptick. Like we had our, our 
our largest sort of single day of reported positive cases since mid-May um, in the middle of last week. So, you know, there are, we still have work to do and, there, and we still need to remain vigilant and committed, which is why the Mask Up Michigan campaign is so important um, to encourage people to stop the spread. We, uh, we had temper, we had, we had uh, for a time uh, enabled uh, socially distant, masked up indoor dining and we've walked that back so we've had to do that. I think if I had to describe what the best part of our response has been, one, it's that the state of Michigan has the most diverse leadership team in the country responding to COVID-19. Gretchen Whitmer is a woman. I'm a black man. We have a black woman as our chief medical executive, Dr. Jonay Caldoun. Um, and so we've been, I think, a little more mindful in other states have been about how this has impacted different communities differently. And the, the specific, one of the specific manifestations of that mindfulness is the coronavirus task force on racial disparities, which I'm chairing. Um, and the reason that we even were able to have an argument to form that was because we were one of the first states to report out our coronavirus infections and COVID-19 deaths with demographic data that included race and ethnicity. That is not something that every state does. That is not something the federal government does with any level of consistency. And that's important because it, it, it matters how this pandemic impacts different communities because we need to have a public health response to the pandemic that is responsive to the needs of different communities. It builds the infrastructure to support the, the health, the treatment, and the recovery of people in different communities in different ways. And so we try to be mindful about that um, from the beginning. We also tried to do our best to stick to the CDC guidelines as they, were, as they came out, like they were uh, a moving target I'll say, and I think that you know, the the this, the failure of the with having a lack of a national strategy on testing and scaling testing capacity, and we're still arguing about that and arguing about contact tracing capacity um, is a problem. We tried to navigate that as best we could, um, you know. But you know, we've we've tried to do our best on terms of building a supply chain for PPE, and maybe there are some things we could have done differently or more effectively in that regard. But um, you know, I'm proud of the work that the professionals. Um, in, in state government and our partners at U of M and other institutions did in our healthcare system. We didn't get to the point where it was overwhelmed. Whereas like I'm hearing stories right now that, that, that Florida is, is at 97% ICU bed capacity. Texas is at 97% ICU bed capacity. We never got there even at our peak. Um, so there's still work to do. Um, we are by no means, we will not be out of the woods on this until there's an antiviral treatment or a vaccine available at scale. And I have no idea when that's going to happen. Like, it's cool that we have some companies that claim to be close, but I don't know when they are actually going to be um, be where they need to be. So we have to remain vigilant. Um, thank you for all of your efforts on that. As someone who spent the first 10 weeks of, you know, pandemic in Michigan and who have family members, oh, basically my entire family who's still who are in Michigan, um, I'm very Hi. thankful for the efforts of you and Governor Whitmer um, throughout the process. Um, how related to that, how is Michigan ensuring the safety and health of voters during this election cycle, which obviously is going to be a very different voting experience for a lot of people? Yeah, yeah, this is a, this is a really important question. And so we actually had some counties hold elections in May. So actually, let me, let me back up before that. So we had our first two confirmed positive cases of COVID-19. We learned of those the night of March 10th. March 10th was also the day of our presidential primary. Um, it's a kind of, it's kind of interesting guys, like sort of the last, like before uh, President Trump did the rally in Tulsa, like, we, like the last rally of the presidential campaign before that was held in Detroit at Renaissance High School on March 9th, like Joe Biden, Gretchen Whitmer, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, me, we're all there, <laughs> crowd, all this kind of stuff, it was crazy. Um, it's just wild that that actually happened and we had the last normal primary um, in Michigan. But we didn't even get to like celebrate that. I mean, both Governor and I endorsed Joe Biden. We didn't get to celebrate that though because at about 9.30 that night, we got word about these confirmed cases and the governor did a press conference at 11.30 and the state has not been the same since. Um, about that. So um, we had, so I'm, I'm, I'm using this, that was like the, the pretext. Now, there were some, munici some, some um, counties that held some municipal elections in May. Um, we actually, uh, by emergency executive action, mailed people uh, absentee ballot applications for that 
election without them having to request it. In Michigan law, you have to request an absentee ballot. Um, we changed the law in 2018, though the voters voted to change the constitution to say that you didn't have to provide an excuse to get an absentee ballot, but you still have to apply for it. Um, we just sent everybody a, a, an application for things, um, which some people didn't like that we did that, but we declared, because I think it's objectively true, that it is safer to vote from your home and put it in the mail than it is to go and wait in line at a polling place. We believe that that is still true. And so we have taken the further action of sending an absent voter application, ballot application to every voter in the state of Michigan um, and ask people to return those. And frankly, are encouraging people to check both the box for the August primary and the November general election, because we believe that that will be the safest way to vote. Now, because we still need to have in-person voting options available for people. We changed our laws in 2018 to allow voter registration up to and including election day. So there needs to be in-person opportunities to do that kind of thing. But we are encouraging anyone who can to vote absentee. This will be the first time in August that I've ever voted absentee in Michigan, for example. Um, I, did, I used to live in Washington State. Washington State's a vote by mail state. But, um, and, I, and I voted in D.C. at McKinley Tech High School. I mean, like, you know, I voted in person. But, but um, um, we're doing this and we're, we're really uh, encouraging everyone to do that because it's the safest way. Now, voting by mail at scale is not trivial. Um, and so we are working to make sure that from, at the state level, we can provide as many resources as we can to local municipal and county clerks to be able to manage the what's probably going to be five times more absentee ballots than have ever been counted in a single election in Michigan. But we also need more resources in order to pull that off. And so one of the things that we are advocating for to the federal government is for resources for safe elections, for resources for voting by mail. And that's why I am very concerned about the rhetoric that I've heard from the president and others that have been decrying and, and attempting to um, cast shadows of doubt over the process of voting by mail. When like voter fraud and voter fraud by mail is, is simply not a thing. In Michigan, it's simply not a thing in the United States. Like the, the, the number of cases over the last 30 years is in the single digits. And it's like, it's, like, it's literally not a thing. And so um, I'm concerned about people sort of casting aspersions on what is clearly the safest way for people to vote. But that is what we're encouraging people to do in Michigan and supporting the, the, the sort of local municipal election administration officials to help them get that done. As someone who has two parents over the age of 65 who have already received their applications for absentee ballots in Michigan, very thankful for that as well. Um, I believe you have some closing remarks. Yeah, I can, sure. So. Um, if not, we can keep asking questions. Let's keep asking questions. I mean, I feel like I, okay. I gave you enough monologue. Let's ask questions. I'm, I'm okay, great. So um, you and the governor recently announced mandatory implicit bias training for all medical professionals in Michigan. Yeah. Um, yeah. This was actually a topic of conversation at one of our recent events um, about the effects of, um, you know, COVID on communities of color. Um, what do you hope to see as a result of that? And is there a way to track those results? Yeah, so um, this is important. And this came as a recommendation from the, my task force on racial disparities. So um, let's go back to the beginning of the pandemic in, in terms of when it landed in Michigan. Um, because we had constrained testing supply, like I alluded to earlier, you had this horrible situation that medical professionals were in where we didn't have enough testing capacity and we had a lot of people who were sick. And so you had people going to doctors, going to hospitals, going to urgent care facilities and begging to get tested. Test me, test my father-in-law, test my, my mom. And this is like, we have families who were just became the, this, the illustration of this, the, the Gambrell family in Detroit, the, the uh, um, oh my gosh, the Bradley family in Grand Rapids, um, where they went and begged for tests and weren't able to get them. And we put the medical pressures in the possible position. And I think that it's clear, whenever there is a point to make a choice, who gets a test and who doesn't, you know, who gets treatment and who doesn't. Those choice points are opportunities for bias to present itself in a decision-making process. And so one of the first actions that we took as a task force while we were working to build up our testing capacity and testing accessibility was to send a letter to every medical professional in the state of Michigan to do what the research says is the first step to dealing with implicit bias. And that is naming it and saying, hey, um, you may, you may be um, exhibiting implicit bias in the choices that you make. 
And like, that doesn't mean I'm calling you racist. That, that means I'm calling you human. Um, we all have these different types of biases and we need to be mindful of them if we're going to deal with their impact. Because the medical professional, also you want to heal people, you want people to get better, you want people to be okay. And so we took that action early. And building upon that, um, we, we made the choice to say that we believe um, that actually we need to be careful and clear that there should not be discrimination when it comes to how testing or any kind of medical treatment is merited out of Michigan. So we took another emergency executive action um, to establish a non-discrimination policy when it comes to medical care. And that includes race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability status, age, um, and a bunch of other factors that will mean your medical, your medical um, um, care will be dictated by your medical condition, period, full stop. And then again, building upon that further, we recognize that, um, you know, we have an opportunity here as a way to deal with disparities in a structural way. We have an opportunity to just evolve what it means to be a medical professional. And what are the tools that medical professionals have in their toolbox to be able to fully serve our communities and our people. And having this training be a requirement of licensure makes sure or, or ensures that professionals will be mindful of that. Now, we, we, we initiated the rulemaking process, and the rulemaking process is not trivial. It's going to take six to 12 months to truly implement this. And the reason it takes so long is because we need to have community public input. We need to have input from professionals about how to do it. We need to know and understand what the best types of training are and what's the most effective delivery mechanism and all these things, the scale, who's going to be responsible for paying for it. All these things are the, the sort of um, the details about how it works. But it was important to us to, to make this statement of values that we want people to understand that when they get medical care in the state of Michigan, that it will be uh, administered to them with an understanding of implicit bias, but also, mean, and, and therefore, with we believe more equity involved. And related to that, given the racial disparities we've seen within, with the incidence of COVID, um, what policies have been put in place to ensure equitable distribution of a COVID vaccine or therapy once it's available? Yeah, this is something that we're taking a look at. We're diving into right now, actually, um, in terms of, you know, what can we do? So I'll, I'll say a couple things. One, um, our, our task force is actually going to be turning an eye toward the fall flu season and making sure that um, actually people of color get flu shots. Like, for example, like Black people are, are statistically underrepresented in terms of the number of people who get flu shots, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, but we do have reason to believe medically that people who have the flu will be more um, susceptible to contracting COVID-19. And so we're very concerned about that. I want to make sure that happens. Um, we also, as part, of, as part of innovating the way that we're delivering testing capacity to, to communities, particularly the vulnerable communities, we did this, um, or this program that we're scaling. It's a partnership with Ford Motor Company and the initial launch partner has been Wayne State University. Um, that has these specially outfitted vans that have medical professionals on board that can like drive thousands of tests to a community and conduct thousands of tests in a day in a place. So in a hard hit zip code or at a jail or at a church or a nursing home or whatever, wherever it is. And so um, that is really a platform that we can transition from use as a mobile testing unit to a mobile distribution mechanism for an antiviral treatment or a vaccine when it becomes available. We are also working on um, the kind of guidance and guidelines that we think are going to be right in terms of making sure that there's equitable distribution of any kind of treatment or vaccine and that the communities that are most susceptible and that have been hardest hit, um, frankly, have the, have the right level of initial access to it, which would not be true by default. It's going to take us actually like making that true. And so we will probably, uh, you know, look at what, what we think are the right guidelines and then make a recommendation to the CDC at the federal level um about about how that should look and and so we're, we're we're diving into that right now and um i i can't say for sure but i wouldn't be surprised if you end up seeing like a letter from the governor and i to the cdc on this issue thank you and thank you very much for joining us tonight um everyone on this call um i'm sure has been has very much enjoyed your comments and has enjoyed getting to hear from you um, do you have any other, I know you have to leave, step away. Um, do you have any closing remarks before you leave? Just, uh, again, what I said um, earlier, uh, we need y'all. 
like the world, our communities, like we need you. I need you to step up. I mean, you can do more. I promise you can do more. I thought I was tapped out. Look, I got three kids, married. We've been working from home primarily, like it's a mess, but like there's more to be done. Um, and all of you are talented enough. All of you are experienced enough to let anybody tell you you're not um, to contribute and to lead. And we need you to be the leaders and best that I know that you are. So um, remember that, be confident in that, and, and, and please, please step up and stand tall. Um, when we do that, our communities will be better for it. And I thank you in advance uh, for doing that in a bigger and better way. And I cannot wait to see what you do. And um, last but certainly not least, I want y'all to come home. Like, I need y'all to come back to Michigan, <laughs> straight up. So, so look, DC's cool, I get it. I lived there for five years, it was great. My twins were born there. Um, but get what you need to get out of DC and then come home to Michigan so we can make, help make our state better. God bless y'all, go blue. Thank you again, go blue. All right.